voudrais très rapidement appeler euh, la prochaine modératrice, euh, Madame Alessandra Cummins, de nous rejoindre, euh, d'introduire le panel et d'inviter les panélistes. Just have to run it so that we finish at six. Yeah, I mean, but uh, I don't want to, to just run it so that we finish at six. So okay. Can, uh, okay. Ladies and gentlemen, can I have the uh, participants in this final round table, please? Hamidi, Christine, Barbara. Okay. There he is. Okay. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We'll get right on to uh, the third and the best roundtable on uh, circulation of cultural property, the new role of museums. I have been asked to keep it brief, and I will manage the process with your assistance. And uh, I'd now like to, um, without any further ado, uh, turn to our first panelist, Madam Christine Bühler Anderson, and to invite her to address us on um, what in 2017 occurred with the archaeological finds at the Colle de Forno Necropolis, and um, which were returned to the Italian government by your institution after a four year negotiation, and how were those discussions negotiated and conducted? Okay. Thank you very much. And just very briefly about the museum, the new Carlsberg uh, Glyptothek uh, is based in Copenhagen, founded by the brewer Carl Jacobsen. You probably know the Carlsberg beer. And uh, he was uh, the brewer who was also a passionate art collector. However, in this case, um, uh, I've been asked to talk about um, the, the, the agreement that was um, signed between the museum and the Italian Ministry of Culture. It was actually in 2016 um, about a long-term collaboration, including the exchange of archaeological objects as well as um, collaboration on ac academic research and knowledge um, for th in the future. And a very central part of this uh, agreement was the return of almost 500 objects um, to Italy that had been bought by the museum in the 1970s um, through the international art market. The objects mostly came from uh, the necropolis of Colle del Forno, um, dating from the 6th and the 7th century. They were acquired by the museum in 1972 and turned out to have been illegally excavated a few years earlier. Um, and the claim was made uh, for, for repatriation f uh, against the museum after that, uh, the fact that the Italian and Swiss police in 1996 discovered the archives of uh, the American dealer Robert Hecht um, 
and found that these objects uh, had been illegally exported out of Italy and sold by him uh, to the Glyptotech. So that was uh, actually a big deal to, to let go of that many objects. Um, but um, And actually the negotiations had been going on since 2002. Um, but was really intensified from 2012 um, when the museum kind of accepted to go into some kind of uh, dialogue. Um, I think that actually, although juridically the museum um, could have claimed the right to keep the objects um, because of the time that had passed since they were acquired, actually agreed to return them after well, a very um, friendly negotiation. I mean, it started out as an aggressive, political, juridical approach. So I think the learnings from this case is actually that it's very important to have um, an academic dialogue between colleagues, because that's what happened between our curators and the Italian colleagues, that we had a very... Um, yeah, kind of practical and uh, academic dialogue about this issue. And, and that's kind of the advice I could give because to generalize from what we did is not possible. I think that every museum has a specific history of its collection and it's very difficult to say just do like the, we did. But what, what we learned was that the academic dialogue between the, the museum and the colleagues abroad was very fruitful. <laughs> Thank you very much, Christine. And uh, I'm now uh, like to turn our attention to the experience of uh, in another part of the world in uh, Dakar. And I'd like to ask you, Hamdi, about the what are the perspectives on the Archino Fund, uh, which notably preserves the precious Quran of Amadou Tal as part of French museum collections at the time of the opening of your new museum of black civilizations. Over to you. Merci beaucoup. On me demande donc ce que cela représente pour nous, ces collections qui sont dans des institutions françaises, dans le cas particulier ici, le Havre. Disons que ça représente deux choses. Euh, en tant qu'Africain, c'est pour moi un fragment de mémoire en exil. Et en tant que professionnel, peut-être une opportunité de faire avancer les choses. Euh, quand je parle de mémoire, euh, de fragment de mémoire en exil, c'est que si je prends le cas simplement de cet ancien Soudan, on a une partie qui se trouve aux Invalides, une autre partie au Havre, et dans les deux cas, on est un peu obligé de négocier pour qu'on nous prête ce qui nous appartient. Donc, euh, du point de vue de la perspective patrimoniale, c'est euh, une plaie assez difficile à gérer. Euh, par contre, du point de vue du professionnel, le pragmatisme va dominer. Avec le Havre, nous menons depuis euh, quatre ans un programme extrêmement intéressant que nous appelons « Mémoire en partage ». Parce qu'il y a au Havre une communauté sénégalaise extrêmement forte, plus de 10 000 personnes, très attachées à leur patrimoine. Et ce patrimoine lui-même est très convoité par les descendants de la famille omarienne. Donc c'est très compliqué. On a une famille maraboutique extrêmement active, extrêmement puissante, aussi bien au Sénégal qu'au Mali, et on a des objets extrêmement symboliques qui sont détenus par les institutions euh, françaises. Et à chaque fois, il nous a fallu emprunter les objets et veiller à ce qu'ils rentrent chez eux. Donc ça pose in fine le problème de la circulation et celui de la restitution. La restitution, c'est un retour définitif. La circulation, c'est un mouvement qui peut être un mouvement de pendule. Donc, rapporté à ce que nous sommes en train de faire en ce moment, et du cas du Havre, hein, c'est une très belle expérience avec le Havre, parce qu'ils ne nous ont pas fatigués avec la bureaucratie, 
on a sélectionné les objets qu'on voulait, on les a mis en caisse, on les a amenés, on ne demand... nous a pas demandé quelle était la température et l'humidité de notre salle d'exposition. Tout s'est très très bien passé, euh, disons de manière informelle. Euh, de l'autre côté, euh, donc, euh, ce glissement sémantique euh, peut mener à des, à, à des impasses. Parce qu'au début, euh, on a parlé de restitution, c'était clair dans la tête de tout le monde. Maintenant, on parle de circulation. Est-ce qu'à terme, on ne va pas noyer le poisson et être dans un processus où on va tourner à vide Or, la restitution pose des problèmes beaucoup plus complexes. Par exemple, si je prends le cas qu'on a étudié ici, la famille Omarienne, ils voudraient vraiment récupérer les Corans écrits par leurs ancêtres et qui sont aujourd'hui dans des boîtes. Au Sénégal, ces Corans auraient été beaucoup plus utiles parce qu'il y a des communautés qui vouent de véritables dévotions à ces objets-là. Malheureusement, ils sont dans des vitrines, on doit les emprunter, veiller sur eux et les gens, quand ils arrivent, ils sont vraiment déprimés. Euh, et si on les ramenait au Sénégal, on ne les mettrait pas dans des vitrines, hein? on va les mettre dans nos mosquées. Euh, de l'autre côté, la restitution peut aussi être une forme de resacralisation, parce que les choses ont été désacralisées. Si on les amène, les, les Africains peuvent décider de les ramener dans la forêt. Où est le problème Donc, je, je, je pense que c'est des questions sur lesquelles il faut réfléchir de manière tout à fait globale. Et il ne faut pas réfléchir, à mon avis, à partir seulement de ce qu'on appelle les références et les normes de muséologie. Mon ministre l'a rappelé ce matin, ces objets, ce n'étaient pas des objets d'art à l'origine. Ils avaient une vie, ils avaient des fonctions. C'est ici qu'on leur a donné une nouvelle fonction, une nouvelle vie. S'ils retournent là-bas, peut-être qu'ils reprendraient leur vie normale, peut-être qu'ils pourriraient dans nos brousses et nos savanes, mais ça, c'est notre problème. C'est notre patrimoine qui revient et qui revit chez nous. Merci. Thank you very much. My, I think my strategy is clear, isn't it, Tay? <laughs> I've called everybody else by their first name. <laughs> I very much appreciate um, your indulgence. I um, want to open the, the floor now to another aspect, a very sensitive aspect, to this whole process of uh, repatriation, in this case of human remains. And I'd like to turn the floor over now to Mr. Te Hedekeke Hedevine to speak about the experience of the Kalanga Aotearoa Restitution Program, which was officially launched in 2003, but the first restitutions actually took place in 1990, with almost 30 years worth of hindsight on the collaboration around these issues. How do you see the evolution of the treatment of these issues in heritage institutions? Thank you very much. Um, firstly, I would li like to thank UNESCO for the kind invitation to attend this conference, and thank you, Madame Audrey Azale. Um, it's a privilege to be here, and it's also uh, great to be part of a fantastic conversation around heritage and also ownership of items taken during colonial times. Um, New Zealand is part of that, has part of that colonial history. I am a native New Zealander, I'm a Māori, and I also happen to be the Head of Repatriation at our National Museum of New Zealand, Te Papa Tongarewa. So it's a personal story for me because the legacy of our ancestors, our ancestors have been in New Zealand for a thousand years, in the Pacific for 3,500 years, and our Melanesian ancestors, we are, are people made up of two different groups, Southeast Asian and Melanesians. Our Melanesian ancestors have been in the Pacific region for over 40,000 years. So we have a long history in the Pacific. However, our ancestors came to New Zealand approximately a thousand years ago, and our connection to our ancestors is very simple through the saying, provide me with a handful of soil from my homeland so, my, so I may feel the warmth of my ancestors and weep. Um, our word for when, in our traditional times, when our people, when our babies were born, the placenta we call the whenua. The whenua is also the name of our land. So when the placenta or the afterbirth came from, from the pregnancy, 
that was brewed into the land. And so we say that the spirit of our land is within us, and we are part of the spirit of the land. So our program, Karanga Aotearoa Repatriation Program, is about seeking our ancestral remains, which are in multitude of institutions throughout the world, because we were colonised by the United Kingdom, the majority of our ancestral remains are in Britain, the United Kingdom. However, we have realised that there are large numbers also in Europe, Germany, um, France, and we have repatriated from France in the past, and that was one of our major success stories. And that was um, mentioned today by the Minister of Culture of France this, this morning. And that was when a little regional museum in Rouen agreed to repatriate a mummified head back to New Zealand in 2007. However, the French government um, disagreed with the repatriation because according to French law at that time, um, museum objects, objects that are in French museums at that time were the ownership of the French government. And so what came from that particular um, engagement is Rouen, on our behalf, Rouen became our repatriation champion. Rouen, on our behalf, um, sought a change to the law. And the law um, that they sought, um, which had to be approved by the lower House of Parliament in France, but also by the Senate, was for a specific clause that allowed our ancestral remains, our mummified heads, to come back to New Zealand. And there were quite a number of clauses as part of that law. And so that law went to Parliament in 2010, and it was initially approved by the Parliament, and then it was approved by the Senate. And in 2011, um, the delegation from New Zealand came to Rouen and uplifted the first uh, mummified head um, from Rouen back to New Zealand. And the following year, we uplifted another 20 of our mummified heads. What I do appreciate about France is that they were willing to consider our request. It may have taken a long time, but at the end, we were able to find a champion on our behalf. And what, so what I am requesting is that Indigenous remains, I'm a Māori, but I want to talk on behalf of my Indigenous brothers and sisters as well. Indigenous remains are in multitudes of countries throughout the country. And so what I would be seeking is that the countries that house our ancestors or Indigenous ancestors consider the requests by Indigenous people for their remains to come home. It's not a, a request, it's not a simple request. It comes with the heart and the spirit of the land for us. The ancestors don't belong to a foreign country, they belong back in the life force that they were nurtured on, and that life force is our respective countries. So I just want to leave it there. Very much appreciated. Uh, thank you very much. I don't think um, we could say that the, the spiritual is very far from this experience in any of these cases but particularly it's true of the need to rethink how we address the notion of human remains as objects. I think that is a key point. I'd now like to turn uh, our attention to Barbara. Um, in, invite Barbara, who is the, with, uh, here from Germany, from Hamburg, to reflect on her experiences of how uh, the dialogue taking place uh, within the Benin Dialogue Group, which she forms a part of, on issues of security, conservation, transport, insurance, all of these aspects echo um, with the project initiated with the Goethe Institute and the German Federal Foreign Office in Hamburg. So over to you, Don Barbara. Thank you very much. I tried to keep it short. Uh, to I think I need to explain a little bit what the Benin Dialogue is, uh, because it is not uh, 
just about um, what is mentioned here, security, conservation, transport, and insurance costs, but it rather is an initiative that started in 2010 um, after a collaboration uh, we had um, on a very prominent exhibition project uh, on the Benin works of art, uh, on, on the works of art of the Benin Kingdom uh, that we organized in Vienna together with three other museums and together with um, the National Commission for Museums and Monuments in Nigeria and the Royal Court. And um, it was the first project to reach out to Nigeria for collaboration. And after we finished that, we joined with the Nigerian museums. We did another project on a textile and tangled story. And through this very long collaboration, so this echoes what my colleague, uh, the first speaker said, uh, this uh, long collaboration built um, trust between the institutions. And um, we, um, we both felt that uh, there needs to happen something about this uh, difficult heritage or legacy, uh, both we, the European museums have, and our Nigerian colleagues. And we created a sort of an informal group between museum colleagues um, to get together and think about jointly how we, we can solve, um, uh, what we can do to enable a presence uh, of uh, these works of art in Nigeria beyond um, property, property uh, discussions and beyond uh, 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 the political agenda and to try to find a moat between us uh, museums because we felt this situation uh, that, uh, as we heard already today, that uh, since the 1970s or even earlier, uh, Nigerian initiatives or museums asking back uh, for um, uh, for the return uh, of their heritage and European Museum saying no, uh, that this was not something that uh, should continue, but we should find other solutions uh, beyond that. And so uh, we had several meetings um, and it was a very long, <laughs> it's a very long process and very complicated because several museums of Europe joined and the group was growing. But it took uh, quite a while to establish trust between the European museums and the Nigerian um, partners uh, because there was a big suspicion on both sides. So I think that was one of the first achievements of this process that I think that we sort of constituted a group. Um, and um, there have been uh, two uh, major um, uh, 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 outcomes. There was a meeting in Benin City in 2013 in which we issued a plan of action that was about um, uh, uh, access of collections on both sides, uh, assistance with expertise and support, um, uh, waiving of reproduction fees, uh, development of libraries, and support on both sides. Uh, and the final aim that was declared then was to create an enabling environment for exchange of exhibitions and loans in both si directions. And I think that was started to be lived. Uh, 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 and then in 2017, last year, there was a meeting in Cambridge in which um, in a joint agreement, the Benin Dialogue agreed uh, on um, to take this Benin Black Plan of Action forward and to take concrete steps toward uh, the the establishment of a permanent display in Benin City uh, by way of rotating material from a consortium of European museums in collaboration with the National Commission of Museums and Monuments and the Royal Court of Benin. And in the meanwhile, there are concrete plans in Benin City to create a palace museum. And I think that will be the next step that we concrete, concretize our issue. But also here, uh, something that you mentioned, um, uh, I think one, uh, uh, we need um, a, a legal framework, not just for uh, restitution or circulation, uh, but we, we definitely need also a legal framework that helps directors of museums in Europe to be able to send out 
loans, you know, even on a permanent basis, uh, and not to be uh, um, uh, uh, to to kind of change um, the the expectations and and uh, um, uh, uh, conditions uh, that are asked, uh, you know, for conservation requirements, which are so complicated that not even we as European museums can follow them any longer, and it. Very often, this is then uh, the, the question that um, uh, subverts uh, uh, the aims we have. Uh, the second um, initiative, I, I'm getting too long, I know, <laughs> um, was different because this, this initiative, the Benin Dialogue, was an uh, initiative by museums themselves. Whereas um, a meeting that took place three uh, weeks ago uh, in Hamburg that we organized together with the Goethe Institute um, with the support of the uh, um, Federal Foreign Ministry of Germany uh, was to sort of um, based on the uh, coalition agreement that the Minister Grütter uh, uh, referred to this morning. And um, there, there was a clear uh, uh, political uh, aim uh, that uh, supported the meeting, and it was along the same line, basically. But uh, there is, uh, there, there certainly will be a larger impact because there is political backing now for a project like this. And um, that certainly uh, uh, make it easier to, to move to concrete action because there is now uh, the goal to, um, for legal and financial backing of these aims. And I can't speak about the details now. Thank you very much, Barbara. I appreciate it. Um, I'd like to um, now turn the floor over to Mr. Vial. Vial? Vial? Vial. Um, to, to ask him to, um, to speak on behalf of the Louvre in terms of its international action, how it is closely linked to the countries from which its collections originate, and it, which currently covers 75 countries. Can you describe the, the form these kinds of cooperations take and the objectives being pursued? And as, as briefly as possible. Thank you. Merci beaucoup pour uh, votre invitation. Et je suis ravi d'être ici en représentation de Jean-Luc Martinez, le président directeur du Musée du Louvre. Et comme vous dites, nous, le Musée du Louvre était très attaché à la coopération internationale et à la circulation euh, d'œuvres. Et nous sommes très liés au pays d'où viennent nos collections, en effet, pour des raisons historiques parce que, bon, le, déjà, le Louvre a été fondé au XVIIIe siècle. Je ne vais, vais pas faire toute l'histoire, je vous rassure. Euh, comme un musée universel, donc avec l'ambition de montrer la richesse de toutes les cultures. Et, et aussi, au, au cours du XIXe siècle, c'était un des musées précurseurs avec la France, et dans l'archéologie euh, et au Moyen-Orient, et il a valorisé, il a contribué à valoriser, à redécouvrir un patrimoine qui était euh, oublié. Et, mais aussi, on est en lien avec les pays d'où viennent nos publics, parce qu'on travaille euh, et on conserve ces œuvres pour euh, nos publics. Comme vous le savez, le Louvre est le musée le plus visité au monde, avec près de 10 millions de visiteurs par an, et dont 70% ce sont des étrangers. Donc c'est une fierté, mais c'est surtout une responsabilité et, et on se doit d'accueillir le mieux possible ces publics. Donc aussi on travaille beaucoup avec ces pays-là qui ne sont pas forcément les mêmes, et les pays d'où viennent nos collections. Donc on a plusieurs types d'actions à l'international avec des objectifs différents. Et donc les, les, plus, les plus anciens, c'est les fouilles archéologiques. Parce que le Louvre, comme je l'ai dit tout à l'heure, était historiquement très impliqué et dans, des, dans certains pays. Et c'est une tradition qu'on a, qu a fait l'effort de, de maintenir. Et donc actuellement, on, on fouille dans six pays, et dont des fouilles dirigées par le Louvre, mais aussi on participe dans une dizaine d'autres pays, dans des fouilles françaises. Et les objectifs de ces fouilles sont plusieurs. L'un, c'est de, de nouer des, des collaborations de long terme. Tout à l'heure, François Desmarais parlait de rétablir la confiance 
et ce genre de collaboration permettent de travailler sur le terrain avec nos, nos partenaires dans les pays sources et, et, et de, de, de nuer des, des relations de confiance. Aussi, ça nous permet de, de, de faire un, un transfert de compétences parce qu'on fouille avec des, des personnels, euh, euh, enfin avec des gens qui, 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 qui habitent sur place. Et aussi, ça nous permet de, de, de compléter et d'améliorer les, les connaissances euh, sur nos collections. Et, euh, et enfin, ça nous permet de travailler en réseau avec euh, les ministères des Affaires étrangères, avec euh, les, les différents instituts français, les écoles françaises et les, euh, les universités. Une, un autre type d'action à l'international, c'est les expositions. Et on fait environ euh, entre 10 et 15 expositions par an à l'étranger. Et, et on prête euh, entre 2 000 et 3 000 œuvres par an à l'étranger. Et les objectifs sont multiples. Et, Là, c'est de mieux connaître les pays d'où viennent nos publics. Donc, par exemple, on fait régulièrement des expositions en Chine. Ça nous permet de publier euh, certains ouvrages en chinois, de développer des outils de médiation, de mieux connaître euh, ces publics-là et des outils de médiation qu'on qu utilise après au Louvre à Paris. Ça nous permet aussi de nous, de nous faire connaître et de nous donner envie au public étranger de venir au Louvre. Et, D'autres, un autre objectif pour faire des expositions, c'est de valoriser les patrimoines de certains pays, aussi de mettre en valeur les découvertes récentes des fouilles archéologiques, aussi faire connaître les œuvres, qui est aussi la meilleure lutte contre les trafics illicites, parce qu'une œuvre qui est connue et reconnue est invendable. Et donc c'est aussi euh, une, euh, un des objectifs de nos expositions à l'étranger. Aussi on veut sensibiliser les populations à la valeur de leur patrimoine. Et aussi a, parfois il y a des objectifs diplomatiques. Donc, par exemple en ce moment il y a une exposition très importante à Téhéran. Et ça s'appelle le Louvre à Téhéran où on présente euh, l'histoire du Louvre, un condensé des, des collections du Louvre et qui permettent aussi de servir aux intérêts diplomatiques de la France. Et en plus, on a des liens scientifiques très, très anciens avec, avec l'Iran. Et ça nous permet aussi parfois de, de, de récupérer du mécénat. Donc, par exemple, avant-hier, on a inauguré une exposition au Japon en partenariat avec une entreprise, NTV. Et, et ça nous permet de... Après, avec cet argent, financer d'autres collaborations et d'autres coopérations euh, ou, qui ont besoin d'être financées. Par exemple, une école, euh, un chantier école au, à, à Tunis. Et aussi, ça nous permet d'entretenir des liens scientifiques avec des grands musées, par exemple aux États-Unis, avec les Met, avec la National Gallery, euh, les Yeti, euh, les musées de San Francisco, par exemple. Et un autre type d'action, c'est la dernière, c'est les, 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 les formations et les expertises grâce à un service qu'on a au Louvre, s'appelle Louvre Conseil. Et, et les objectifs, c'est bon, les transferts de compétences, mais aussi restaurer les patrimoines détruits ou en mauvais état avec les populations locales. Donc on fait avec, et on fait pour et avec, et, et aussi lutter contre les trafics illicites et avec des formations avec des professionnels irakiens et libyens notamment. Et après, il y a deux autres projets, mais je parlerai après si, si j'ai le temps. C'est la, la protection du patrimoine en danger et le Louvre à Abu Dhabi. Si je n'aurai pas le temps, peut-être je le dis tout de suite, juste un moment, parce que c'est deux, deux projets très très importants euh, du Louvre à l'international. L'un, c'est euh, la protection du patrimoine en danger. Comme vous savez, le Louvre est très impliqué dans la protection du patrimoine en danger. Jean-Luc Martinez a rédigé un rapport pour le président de la République en 2015 avec 50 mesures françaises pour la protection du patrimoine en danger. Un rapport qui a été présenté ici à l'UNESCO par le président François Hollande à l'occasion du 70e anniversaire de l'UNESCO et, et qui a donné lieu à une conférence internationale à Abu Dhabi en 2016 pour sensibiliser les, les décideurs. 
avec participation des 40 pays et l'UNESCO. Et en 2017, et la création de l'ALIF, qui est l'Alliance internationale de protection pour le patrimoine en danger, et avec plus de 75 millions d'euros, qui va permettre de reconstruire et réhabiliter des musées et des sites pour la première année, notamment en Irak et au Mali, et avec l'implication des populations locales, encore une fois. Et donc c'est un, une, cette protection est quelque chose de, 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 ces, de ces patrimoines est quelque chose qui nous tient à cœur et qui euh, aussi est un, un engagement fort de la France et du président François Hollande, mais aussi du président euh, Emmanuel Macron. Et, et enfin, le dernier grand projet, c'est le Louvre Abu Dhabi. Et qui, euh, qui a été appelé euh, par la presse, hein, par, par, par moi, comme le plus beau musée du monde, et, ou le projet culturel euh, le plus ambitieux du XXIe siècle. Et donc c'est un musée universel. Et quelqu'un disait ce matin que les, tous, les musées, tous les musées universels ont une partie euh, des barbaries dans leur histoire. Et bon, ce, ce n'est pas tout à fait le cas. Et celui-ci, c'est un musée qui est une réponse à la barbarie. Et donc, c'est à quelques kilomètres de destruction euh, euh, de Daesh, d'ailleurs. Donc, c'est un signe fort, un message d'ouverture face au, au fanatisme. Et, et il nous fait redécouvrir les, les rôles des musées universels aujourd'hui. Pas seulement à Abu Dhabi, mais, mais partout. Et donc, parce que c'est une... parce qu'on pourrait être tenté de croire que c'est une invention du XVIIIe siècle et qui n'a plus sa place aujourd'hui. Thank you. Mais juste. Thank you. Thank you. You can do it in the next round. I'm going to go to the next round. Thank you so much. Okay. So, ladies and gentlemen, I have a very limited time frame. I do want to give uh, each of the speakers one uh, last chance to have a few words. Uh, reflecting on, on what has been uh, said so far. Essentially, I think the tropes that you're hearing in this panel speak more to the issues of um, moral, uh, uh, moral opportunities, uh, perhaps even more than legal or indeed uh, political. The moral and the diplomatic seem to be uh, what is coming through. Um, based on long-term uh, associations and based on the the building of trust, and this is what we are hearing from each of your experiences. So now, each of the speakers has two minutes, two minutes, and I mean it. Um, and I'd like to turn now to Christine and ask how uh, the new museological initiatives that the Gupta Tech has produced, resulting from these newly developed partnerships, how are they being implemented today? Well, I think when you go through the kind of negotiations that we have been going through, you will always think as a kind of natural psychological question, what will we get in return? If we give back all these objects, what will we get out of that? But in our case, it has not really been that kind of trade or expecting a reward, because uh, you can't, um, actually, I think. Um, um, in this kind of case, but, but what has been important is that we have been negotiating that the repatriation of the object has come with, um, uh, you know, uh, an agreement on long-term collaborations at the academic field, which means that we are already now very much involved in very exciting projects in Italy and also the, the diplomatic climate between Denmark and Italy in the cultural field, to say the least, has been become much better and means that uh, for some of our researchers who are experts on polychromy, on antique Roman sculptures, they have the possibility now of pa participating in the very heart of Rome where excavations are starting now at the Forum of Cisa. And if they find sculptures, they, they certainly will, with co uh, polychromy uh, remains of color. Our experts and researchers have been invited to participate and perhaps we can do some, you know, um, loans for Copenhagen to show this and a collaboration will continue. And that's, I think, what it's all about um, to, to come up with new knowledge in collaboration together with our colleagues abroad. I don't know how long that was. <laughs> long enough. Thank you. Hamdi, <laughs> your turn. <laughs> how do you foresee, how do you foresee 
uh, the continuation of these collaborations that have been undertaken between the uh, French, uh, with the French or uh, European institutions. Um, how do you foresee these, these collaborations continuing around the exchange of collections? Ben, je, je pense qu'on va essayer d'être très pragmatique. Euh, comme a eu à le dire France de Marais tout à l'heure, il faut travailler cas par cas. On a une euh, expérience très pragmatique et très enrichissante avec euh, le Havre. Je pense qu'on donnera ça en modèle avec euh, les grands musées avec lesquels on a des conventions. On a une convention avec le musée du Quai Branly, Jacques Chirac. On en a une avec euh, le Musée Royal d'Afrique centrale à Tervuren. Et certainement, on va en développer non seulement avec l'Europe, mais avec euh, d'autres parties du monde, partout où on retrouve les représentants des civilisations d'Afrique et de la diaspora. Maintenant, de manière plus générale, il faut espérer que cette réflexion se poursuive, qu'il y ait à la clé un instrument normatif ou une déclaration qui engage plus ou moins la communauté internationale. Merci. Merci bien. Thank you. To, to your colleague to the, to the right, and um, to your left, I mean. And I really thank you very much for these short but concise reflections, and I hope that, Tay, you will also take this example. So I'd like to ask you what curatorial opportunities have arisen from the processes put in place to enable the return of these human remains? With um, the repatriation program within New Zealand, with the mandated program for the whole of the country, and we are specific to the return of Māori and Moriori ancestral remains. So we do not seek the return of um, collection, other collection items, just our ancestral remains. One of the engagements we do undertake with um, institutions overseas is that, in exchange of information, if a museum has our ancestral remains, they most likely also have our cultural items. So what we would like, what we do is that we share information. Um, what we have noticed, and I have noticed, I'm visiting quite a number of um, European institutions and institutions in North America. They know very little, they may, know, they may have our cultural items, but they know very little about us, and they know very little about the cultural items themselves. So we share our expertise of our knowledge about our cultural items with those institutions overseas as part of the process of repatriating our ancestral remains. I do want to um, acknowledge that the New Zealand government fully sponsors, fully resources our repatriation program. And so when we go overseas to uplift our ancestors, we go um, with the blessing not only of the Māori people, the Moriori people, but also the blessing of the New Zealand, pub New Zealand government and the New Zealand public. And it's important for us to um, uplift our ancestors with respect and dignity. So we thank those overseas institutions and um, for the care of our ancestors while they're being overseas. Thank you very much, Tia. And I'd like now to turn the floor over to Barbara for her, her um, final thoughts on this matter. Really, what are your perspectives on um, how the Nigerian authorities have launched a project to build a museum in Benin City? Um, well, uh, will this Benin Dialogue, will, it gr will this group participate in the elaboration of the project of this new institution? And could uh, a new museum in Nigeria like the one being built in Senegal today, change the orientation of your work towards permanent repatriation? Okay, to the first question, uh, I have to clarify, there is a museum in Benin City that is uh, uh, from the national, it's a national institution, but there is the plan from the Royal Court to bu build a new palace museum. Um, and. Uh, I think it's a decision of our Nigerian partners. If they wish our participation, um, then we would uh, certainly do um, as good as we can. The second question, if a new museum uh, would uh, change the orientation, I think um, if uh, uh, restitution or repatriation is, should not de be dependent on a new museum. It's a question, a dif different question altogether. But I think it helps 
to move the process further, particularly with decision takers in, in the, on the political level and also with uh, those museum colleagues who are very hesitant about the process. Thank you very much, Barbara. And now I'd like to go to you, Monsieur Villar, and you have two minutes um, to consider how does the new international policy fit into France's diplomatic and cooperation priorities with culture as a bridge? And I think you already began to address this, so you could finish that sentence and then we could conclude. Okay. Hello. <laughs> Donc, euh, l'art a toujours été au cœur des, des relations diplomatiques et euh, de nombreux cadeaux diplomatiques, euh, d'ailleurs, qui sont parmi nos, dans nos collections, en témoignent. Et les fouilles aussi ont toujours été euh, faites dans la corde des cadres intergouvernementaux. Et, et je voudrais juste, euh, comme j'ai déjà parlé, de deux priorités diplomatiques fortes de la France à laquelle le Louvre euh, s'est inséré euh, avec euh, joie, s'est inscrit pour protéger le patrimoine euh, en danger. Et euh, le deuxième, c'est le Louvre à Abu Dhabi. Et je voudrais juste dire un mot par rapport à, au Louvre à Abu Dhabi, qui nous fait redécouvrir les rôles des musées universels aujourd'hui. Est-ce qu'aujourd'hui, les musées universels ont toujours un sens et, dans nos sociétés Est-ce qu'ils peuvent euh, ou, contribuer à transformer la société ou pas et je pense que oui, parce que le musée universel nous aide à comprendre les complexités de, de notre histoire et, et en racontant les cheminements de l'humanité, la, la fécondation mutuelle des cultures et, et aussi nous permet de mieux connaître nos racines, notre propre culture, mais aussi les, cultures, enfin les autres cultures. Et, et dans ces... Et, et ainsi euh, voir la, la beauté de, du génie de la création humaine. Et donc les musées universels sont un lieu de dialogue, de redécouverte de l'autre, et euh, qui sont plus que jamais, qui ont une mission euh, aujourd'hui euh, dans la société et, euh, très importante pour euh, transmettre notre culture euh, commune aux générations futures. Merci. Merci bien, monsieur, and thank you very much, all of our speakers. Thank you very much for indulging me uh, in uh, our attempt to keep to time. I, I think that we have had a, a very brief but intense glimpse of what it means to work in this field with these major and very complex issues surrounding our day-to-day -day work. But what I'd like to congratulate each of the speakers on is bringing very clearly into the foreground the work that the, the, the professionals do, the academic, if you like, uh, to, to really make these issues real and how to handle them with grace, respect, and professionalism. And this is critical if we are to continue this dialogue, continue seeing uh, museums as a forum for communication and for development of communities, as was alluded to by the president this morning and various of the ministers. And I'd like also to thank you for enabling us to understand that trust is the key element to this construction uh, at whatever level, however big or small the project. I'd like then to thank Madam Director General for this opportunity to have this important conversation with the speakers, but also with all of you in the room. I hope it has given you food for thought. I hope it helps you to understand the roles that museums could play if they are not already playing in your community. And I hope it also gives us time to think about the ways in which we can put the 2015 recommendation on the protection and promotion of museums and collections to the best use because issues like this are going to continue to be important for most of the world's um, uh, citizens. And museums have a way to help us disperse the issues in the best and the most collegial fashion. So I thank you for your attention. I'd now like to uh, look to uh, my colleague to, to wrap up and uh, wish you all the best. Um, and thanks for your attendance for today. Thank you.